<laughs> My enemies came for me at night time. Before I knew they were there, they pounced upon me. Before I could even unsheath my claws, they dragged me to the supremest court of all galactic order. And there, the chief elder said that I, as former Lord High Emperor, had been so ruthless in my desperate attempts to claw my way to power that I would be banished to a wasteland planet inhabited by carnivorous ogres. A lesser cat may have begged for mercy. Instead, I only offered them my scorn. You feckless felines, I say. You may throw me out like yesterday's garbage, but I'll be back. And then, in an instant, I was transported 2,900.4 million miles across space to the most desolate, horrible, awful planet in the universe. Earth. <gasps> I hear one of the Earthlings now. I flee now. Hi there, it's Mr. Jonathan with the Osceola Library System, and today is Sunshine Readers Book Club, where every two weeks we talk about one of the books from the Sunshine Readers Awards list for grades three through five. Today's book is Claude, Evil Alien Warlord Cat by Johnny Marciano and Emily Chenoweth. And this book is about Whiskers, a cat who is an evil alien warlord who is banished to Earth for being a tyrant. And on Earth, he's adopted by Raj, a boy who's just moved from Brooklyn, New York, and left all of his friends and all of the places he loved to move to Elba, Oregon. And while there, his parents make him join a survival camp, hoping he'll make friends and learn some nature survival tips. And this isn't something Raj wants to do. It doesn't sound fun to him at all. The only thing he likes about Oregon is his new cat, Claude. But little does he know, Claude is not just an ordinary cat. In fact, he's an alien who can read our minds, speak our language, build teleporters, and use the toilet. But Raj is so happy with his new pet, and Claude learns how to be a friend and what that actually means. And Raj learns how to summon his inner warlord and be courageous in the face of new adventures. And right now, we're going to talk some more about this book with my friends at the library. Come on! Hi, everybody. Today, I'm going to show you how to make an amazing treat that you can share with your friends that is so fun, but a little bit gross, too. I'm gonna show you how to make a kitty litter cake. I know that sounds disgusting, but that's the best part of it. So what you're going to need is you're going to need one German chocolate cake mix, but I didn't like German chocolate cake, so I just put in a regular chocolate cake. You're gonna need one white or yellow cake mix. I used yellow cake. And you're gonna need the eggs and the oil that go along with making that. You're also gonna need one six ounce box of vanilla pudding that's instant. And you're gonna need the milk that goes with that and you're going to need one 18 ounce package of vanilla sandwich cookies. If you have green food coloring, I can show you something that's going to make it even grosser. You're gonna need 12 small Tootsie Rolls. You're going to need one new kitty litter box. Make sure it's new because we don't wanna gross them out too much. And one new pooper scooper. Again, make sure it's new because that'd be really gross. Now, the neat thing about this treat is that you can make most of it ahead of time. So last night I made my chocolate cake and my vanilla cake. And I didn't have to make it all fancy because all I was going to do was take it and break it up into pieces. So you can see that I started breaking up the chocolate cake and my first vanilla cake. I made my chocolate cake in a 13 by nine pan, just a rectangular one. And I made my vanilla cakes in two nine inch round pans. And basically all you're gonna do is you're going to take your cake and you are going to break it up into small pieces just like this. Now, I said this was gonna be gross, but I didn't want it to be too gross, so guess what? I made sure I already washed my hands, so you should really make sure you wash your hands too. So, I'm taking this cake and I'm breaking it up. Once I'm done breaking this up, I am going to take some of the other things that I made and I am going to add them to it, and I'll show you how to do it coming right up. Now that I've finished crumbling up my cakes and putting them in my kitty litter box, now I need to take my vanilla sandwich cookies and I need to crumble them up. And the easiest way to do that is with a food processor. Now, be careful. If you're using a food processor, make sure that you're doing it with your grown-up. You don't want anybody getting hurt. What I did was I took about five vanilla sandwich cookies. I put them in the food processor. 
I put my top on and I pressed the highest setting I had, which was the food processor setting. Now, depending on your food processor, if you have one, it might be a different setting. It doesn't really matter as long as you get the cookie crumbs to look something like this. Now, it's going to be very loud. So here we go. Ready? And watch. Now, when I stop it, I can see that there are some still big chunks. The big chunks are where the cream is in the middle, so I might need to pulse it. I might need to pulse it a couple times, all right? All right. I probably shouldn't try to talk while I'm doing the food processor. I'm gonna pulse it one more time, and I think that might be good. All right, that is awesome. And you can see it makes a big, big mess. So I am going to very carefully, like I said, make sure you're growing up because I'm going to take my blade out. I'm going to take my cookie crumbs and I'm going to put them in my container with the rest of them. Now, with this cookie crumbs, I am going to take one quarter cup of my cookie crumbs and I am going to put it in a separate little bag or a container of some sort. So I took my one quarter scoop, I put it in here, and I told you before that I was going to take my green food coloring and show you something gross. I put the rest of my cookie crumbs aside and I'm going to take my green food coloring. And the reason I'm putting it in a Ziploc baggie is because food coloring really stains your hands and I really don't want to get dirty. So I'm going to take one or two drops and I'm going to put it in my bag. I'm going to zip it up, get out all the air, and with my hands, I am going to take it and I am going to mix it together. Or I can shake it if I wanted to. I think I might need a couple more drops of food color. If I prefer, I could put it in a bowl and I could use a fork. If I prefer, I could use my hands and get really messy, but I don't want to do that. So here we go. I'm going to actually leave some air in there and I'm going to shake it this time. Maybe that might work better. Let's see, does that work? Oh, they're getting green. They're getting green. All right, you're going to need that until they're green. And these little pieces are going to be the chlorophyll pieces that you find in your kitty litter that makes it not smell. Now, while I'm shaking this up, and I think it might need a couple more drops of green, if you don't have at home a food processor, then you can crumble up these cookies by using a rolling pin, that would work. Or if you don't have a rolling pin, you could use a can, like a can of vegetables or something like that, make sure it's clean. Or you put your cookies between some wax paper or you put them in a Ziploc bag like this. And then what you do is you just take it and you roll the can over it and that will um, smoosh them up for you. All right, so now I have my little green pieces. We're gonna save this, put this aside too, put all of this aside, and then we're going to go on to the next step of our cake. Okay, now the next step is to take our kitty litter box full of the broken up cake pieces, take our crumbs from our cookies, and take the pudding that I made last night and we're going to mix them together. So a little trick with pudding is when you make pudding, if you take your plastic wrap and cover it and push it down to the top of the pudding, it won't get that skin on top of it that they call it. It won't get that skin on top of it, that little bit of hard section on the pudding. So that's a little trick. So I am going to start out by taking about half of my cookie crumbs and putting them into the bowl with the cake. I use about half. And I'm gonna start out with about half of the pudding. We wanna make our cake moist, but we don't want it to be soggy. So I'm gonna take about half that pudding and I am just going to mix it all together like this. If you think you need a little bit more pudding, 
add a little bit more pudding. If you don't think you need that much pudding, don't add any more. And oops, my scoop's a little dirty, but shh, don't tell anybody. There'll be some pudding crumbs in, not pudding crumbs, there'll be some cake crumbs in my pudding. So I'm going to mix this up. And I think what this is, is so that when you get to your final cake, the inside won't just be pieces of cake that you're eating. It'll be almost like a little bit of a mushy, like a mushy cake. So, all right. I think that might be it. We are almost finished. And we're going to go on to our next step. Okay, now here comes the really gross part. You're gonna take your 12 Tootsie Rolls and you're going to unwrap them three at a time. You're going to make sure that you put the Tootsie Rolls on a microwave safe plate. And we're going to put them in the microwave for about 10 seconds at a time. Now, 10 seconds should be enough to make them soft, but not liquid. All right, so I've got my three Tootsie Rolls. I'm going to put them in the microwave and I'll be right back. Okay, they just came out of the microwave and I'm going to take them and see how they have that flat end? I'm gonna use my fingers and I'm gonna pinch it and I'm gonna tap it so it doesn't look so flat. And what do you think these are gonna be in our cake? Do you know? Look, it's kitty cat poop. Oh, that's too funny. Now, you're gonna take your hands, like I said, tap on the ends, make sure it's not so fat, flat, round it out a little bit. If you wanna pull it a little bit to make it long, a little bit longer, but you don't wanna have any of those lines in there. All right, and you don't want it to be so flat on the ends. Ugh, yuck. Your friends are gonna freak out when they see this. This is so disgusting, I love it. All right, so now what you're gonna do is you are going to do the rest of your Tootsie Rolls, three at a time like this, and then you're going to have a whole plate of kitty cat poop that's going to go into your cake. Okay, now what you're gonna do is you are going to take about half of your Tootsie Rolls, the ones that you turn into the kitty poop, and we're going to bury them inside the cake. Now, I have a little bit more than 12, so you can put about six inside the cake, and you can see as I'm putting them down there, I'm spreading them out and no one will ever find them until they go to bite and do it. All right, so I put about six in there. And now what I'm going to do is I am going to take the rest of my cookie crumbs and I'm going to sprinkle it on top. And you wanna sprinkle it so that you really can't see too much of that chocolate cake. All right, so let me show you. I'm not done with my cookie crumbs yet, but let me show you what it looks like. So I'm gonna just take it and I'm gonna sprinkle a little at a time until I'm just about done. And then remember those green cookie crumbs we made? We took the cookie crumbs, we put the green food coloring in them and I said we would use them later. That's like the chlorophyll that you find in cat litter that makes it not smell so bad. We're gonna take some of that you might not use all of it. We're gonna take some of that and we're going to sprinkle it on top. All right, I'm gonna use about maybe half because I don't want it to turn all green. But some of the bigger pieces actually work really well. I didn't think that they would, but they do. And so now you can see the green in there also. Now I'm going to take the rest of my Tootsie Rolls and I'm gonna place them on top so you can see them. This is so disgusting. I love it. And people are gonna look at this and be so grossed out by it. It might not even be worth making this dessert because maybe no one's gonna eat it because it looks so realistic. And there you go. Now, if you want, you could take one of the Tootsie Rolls, leave one to the side before you bake it in the microwave, and you could take it and you can bend it like this and put it hanging over the side. And if you do, just make sure maybe you roll it in some of these, while it's hot, it'll stick to it, some of that kitty litter stuff. All right, now you could take your pooper scooper, dig right in to the kitty litter cake, 
and this will be the grossest treat you have ever made to eat. Oh, have so much fun making it and have an even better time tricking your friends the looks on their faces when they see this. It will be priceless. Have fun. Hi again. So we're discussing Claude, evil alien warlord cat. And I'm here with my friends, Miss Susan from the Buenaventura Lakes Library. Miss Lisa. <laughs> Miss Lisa from the West Osceola Library <laughs> and Miss Crystal from the St. Cloud Library. <sighs> so today's game is we are going to read some of what Claude is talking about and try and guess because he is an alien so he doesn't know about everything that we know about Earth and so there are some times in the book where he is describing something and it can sound very confusing but he's usually describing something familiar. So I'm going to play some videos for you guys and have you guess what Claude is talking about. Are you ready? Mm -hmm. Okay, here is the first one. As I scan the area of carnivorous ogres, something wet hit me on the nose. There was liquid falling from the sky. Was this some sort of chemical weapon? Was I under attack? I rushed under a leafy bush, but it offered little protection. The liquid slid down my lustrous fur, chilling me to the bone. I didn't know what it could possibly be. All right. Any guesses what Claude is talking about? Miss Susan? The evil, nasty rain, which is rain. falling from the sky right now. <laughs> Very good. Yes, Claude has never encountered rain before. Okay, here we go. Next video. All around stood massive fortresses, packed in so close they almost touched one another. High wooden walls surrounded their patches of territory. In front of the fortresses sat huge tank-like vehicles. This must be a very warlike planet indeed. Okay, I don't know who that guy is playing Claude, but he's a very hammy actor. He should chill it down. So, <laughs> uh, what do you think Claude was describing in that clip, Miss Lisa? The houses, like the neighborhood. The houses. He thinks they're fortresses because he's from a warlike planet, right? <laughs> okay, uh, I will share the next one. I raced to the nearest fortress. Next to its front portal was a glowing button, a push button. <gasps> The entrance. Perhaps this would allow me to sneak in without being noticed. I leaped up and pressed it. Ding dong! Why did it make that awful noise? Okay. That is definitely a doorbell. A doorbell. <laughs> He's never seen a doorbell before, right? <laughs> okay, here we go. Next clip. They took out a box poured some sort of sand into it and attached a cover. They kept lifting me and placing me inside. I had no idea what they wanted me to do in there. Dig? But why? I'm going through this right now with a new cat. So, <laughs> what do you guess? Oh, uh, I saw Miss Lisa's hand. Kitty litter box. A kitty litter box! <laughs> okay. Next clue. I just thought they knew what to do. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes they do. Maybe not if you're an alien, right? Here we yeah, go. Yeah, maybe not. <laughs> Their food they placed inside an enormous box that was divided into two compartments. Using all my strength, I managed to pull open one compartment. The food inside was frozen. But why? The second compartment, however, held items that were merely cold. I licked everything. Okay, what do you think Claude is talking about? <laughs> Miss Susan? The refrigerator and freezer. The refrigerator. <laughs> <laughs> I licked That's a everything. bad kitty. It is a bad, bad kitty. Bad kitty. <laughs> All right, 
Here we go. We have three more clues. Much of what the humans considered food disgusted me. There was, however, a long yellow rectangle that was rather tasty and even more delicious white liquid inside a carton. I also found 12 smooth brown ovals in a box. I bit into one. It cracked open and a yellow orange glob suspended in a thick clear goo oozed out. <sighs> I ate it. <sighs> it was disgusting. <clears throat> Okay, any guesses, Miss Lisa? The first one I'm thinking is a stick of butter, the yellow rectangle. Yeah. The second one was milk from the carton, and the third one was an egg. He took it out of the carton and ate it. Ooh. Yes. <laughs> Poor He's going to have beautiful egg. coat. <laughs> <laughs> okay. After he more. throws up. <laughs> right? Two more. Here we go. Enraged, I batted with the thin black tail of the nearest appliance. Almost all of their technological objects had tails, with three silver prongs. Were they for decoration? Everything does look better with a tail, after all. Then I noticed several small holes in the wall that were the same size as the silver prongs on the tails. Perhaps this was a power source. Yes. <laughs> That's a plug. That's a, that's a power cord. A plug, a plug, yes. Okay. We'll stick your fingers in where it goes. Uh-uh, don't do that, Claude. Uh -uh. Okay, last one. Here we go. The human put its lips to my fur and made a loud smacking sound. And then it let me go. Before I could even ponder what this meant, something even stranger happened. The ogre stretched out on a soft platform, covered itself with a large piece of cloth, and died. <laughs> this book made me laugh so hard. <laughs> okay, what do you think the platform was? His bed. His bed. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, that was a lot of fun. And now, Miss Susan is going to help us make a catnip toy. Hey everybody, it's Miss Susan and I'd like to make some kitty toys today. Now, um, you know, Claude, evil alien warlord cat, I think that if he was given a catnip toy, he would probably like it. Most cats do like catnip. So I thought, let's make a couple catnip toys. Now, I just found some things around the house to use to make some toys for my kitties. And when I'm finished with this, we're going to see if they like them. Now, I made one already. All this was was just a square of fleece that I had left over from a blanket that I made. And I just sewed it around the edges. I sewed it around the one edge, stuffed some cotton balls in it because I didn't have any pillow stuffing. So I stuffed a couple cotton balls in there and I sprinkled some catnip in it and then I sewed it closed. You can use just about anything lying around the house. An old sock, for instance. Now, um, don't go using socks that are new. This one actually had a hole in that I had to sew up before I did this because the catnip would come out. And I'm going to do this one first because it's going to be very quick and easy. Now, my cats love to play in plastic bags. So anything that crinkles, really, even if it's paper, they'll chase it. So I'm going to put some... I cut a, a regular old plastic grocery bag into some strips. I'm going to stuff some of this down into the toe of the sock like this. Oh, this will make a nice crinkly sound. I think they'll like it. Now let's use, yeah, I'm going to use this one too. Stuff that in there. I don't need to, I don't think you really need to stuff it in there really tight. And then I'm going to put some good old catnip that I bought at the store um, in there. If I can get it open, I will do that. And I think they know I have this catnip out here because they've been wanting to come out and see what I'm doing. But we'll go in in a little bit and see what they're doing. Let me do this first. I'm going to roll this down just to make it a little easier to put the catnip in there. 
I'm just going to put a handful, a couple pinches in there. Just enough. Oops, I spilled it. Mm, disaster. That's okay. We'll use that in the next one. And then I'll just stuff the rest of oops, rest of the this that inside there. Like that. Again, nice crinkly. And then I'm just going to tie the end, the open end in a knot, just like that. And kitty toy, crinkly kitty toy. Now, I also had some scraps of regular old felt lying around. So I took two and I'm going to, I just drew a circle on there. I'm going to very quickly cut this circle. Now, these scissors that I'm using aren't very good for doing this, but that's okay. They'll cut the circle. It doesn't have to be 100% perfect. And because, you know, they're going to play with it and ruin it anyways, probably. So there's that. And then I'm going to take, I already have some thread on a needle all ready to go. And I'm basically just going to sew around the outside edge of this. I'm not going to sew it the whole way, though, because we need to be able to stuff it. So I'm going to um, take a, co a couple cotton balls and stick down inside there. Maybe pull them apart a little bit like this. And put that, I'll just put one in. Put it down in there so it puffs up a little bit. Get some of this catnip off my table. I'm gonna put that in there. Probably put, whoops, a little more in there. I think that'll be fine. And then I'm just gonna finish sewing this up real quick. And I'm almost finished with this. Um, I will say that I did get, I did look on the internet and there are lots of cute ideas for making homemade cat toys. Um, but I just chose what I did because these ones were fairly easy and simple, but there's, there's a lot out there that you can do for your kitty. And gonna move the knot here maybe and actually don't lose don't lose your needles on the floor they're awfully hard to find easy to find with your feet though especially if you're barefoot like I am right now so I'm going to tie this together in a knot and then we will see how my kitty cats like these. Be right back. Okay, so let's take these into the other room and see how my kitties, Lucky and Bubba, like them. Here we go. I guess they like them. from Point Santa Library and I have brought you a craft that you would do if you were to go to like a summer camp like Raj did and today I'm going to show you different versions of being able to do a craft that is also related to nature and in our first one here this is for your school-aged kids this is an outdoor scavenger hunt and you can make this up on your computer yourself and you can tell in each box it says a different thing like this one has squirrel this has bird when your children see that they're going to draw what they see so make sure that you take a pencil and a good eraser 
and they're going to draw the different things. Uh, one of them was something rough, which I put tree bark right here. Um, something smooth, I put a rock. Um, something sticky, I put a web. And then after they draw what's on here, the fun part is to take it back and to color it in. So that one's a good one for the older age kids. Now, for the if you have little ones going with the older age kid, that's fine. You can make up, get a little clip art going, make a little scavenger hunt for them as well. But with theirs, you can have little stickers. And when they see the different things, the stop sign, the bird, or a dog, or a mailbox, they're going to take the little sticker and they're going to put it over the top of it. Now, I used to love to do this with my niece and nephew, give them a scavenger hunt. And they had so many minutes, especially um, during like Thanksgiving or Christmas when we all got together. I'd give them the scavenger hunt. They would have so many minutes to run out in nature and find different things on the list. And whoever found the most things got a little tiny dollar store prize. And they absolutely loved it. So these are two simple ideas for the older one and the younger one so they can both participate. Now this is also good for both ages. This is when they take a nature walk this is a nature color wheel. So as they're going on their nature walk, you might have them carry a little bag with them and they're gonna be looking for things with different colors. And you're gonna have them actually color the plate themselves and you can add more colors, you can have less colors. If it's a littler one, probably a few less. Do stick with some primary colors. And the older the child is, have them color in the more. And as they find it, when they get all finished, they can save them up put it in a bag, or as they find each one, they can just take a clothespin and clip whatever it is onto the plate. And a third option would be to actually glue them on as they're finding them. So this is a good one to get out and move around in nature to find things with different colors and to actually seek different things out. So I really like this one too. This was a really good one. And last but not least, my ultimate favorite, this is one my son absolutely loved. We would, when we went out for a walk into the, into uh, grandpa's fields, into the air, into the upper foresty areas, I'd have him bring a bag and he would pick up different things that were interesting to him and he would put them in a bag. And then when we got home, I would give him a big piece of paper or poster board and he would glue those things down. And then when dad came home, he would say, hey, this is what I found. And if we had time, we would look it up find out what kind of tree did that leaf come from? Or what kind of, if it's an acorn, what kind of tree goes with an acorn? If it's a walnut, what does a walnut tree look like? And he would get to discuss and tell his dad what, what he went on and what he did with his nature walk. So these are all very good crafty type ideas to go with you on a nature walk or a nature hunt or a nature scavenger hunt. All right, and thanks for joining us. And now we have a special guest. We have the illustrator of the Claude series, and he also illustrated Frostbite by Julia Dweck and several books by Amy Crane Johnson. He's a graphic designer and uh, an illustrator who does comic books, children's books, game art, and character design. We have Rob Momards. Hi, thanks for joining us. Thanks, thanks for having me. Yeah, so, uh, I have to tell you while we start uh, that I loved this book and part of the reason why I loved it was the illustrations in this book. Oh my gosh, this one in particular is my favorite. Yeah. When Claude goes into the fridge and has to try all of the human food and figure out what it is. I just yeah. really captured uh, the like the grumpy quality of Claude in a way that like would be so good in an animated movie too. That'd be great. Right? Fingers yeah. crossed. I know my kid is crossing his fingers for it because he asked me when we could watch the movie and I was like, not yet. <laughs> How old is your son? He's five. So five. Uh, wow. perfect age for this book. He loved it. Perfect. <laughs> so uh, when you were growing up, like what were the uh, like movies or comic books that really inspired you to want to start drawing? Oh, there's so many of them. I don't even know where to begin with that. Um, I was a big fan. When I was really little, I was, a, I was a huge fan of the Muppets. Anything that the Hanson Company produced, um, that was a huge inspiration. I used to draw the Muppets all the time. Sesame Street characters and the Muppet Show characters, Dark Crystal. Um, 
and Star Wars was another one that was huge for me. And uh, as far as cartoons, I you know I grew up on all of, like the Looney Tunes and all the Hanna Barbera shows, all the really bizarre um, stuff from the '70s and '80s. Um, but that always inspired me, and I was I was constantly drawing you know, Bugs Bunny, Fred Flintstone, Disney stuff as well. So very cool. Uh, so are you still like even as an adult into those kind of like fandoms and animated shows? Yes, definitely. I'm a, I'm a huge fan, a big Star Wars fan still. And uh, I, I go to all, all the nearest comic book conventions near me and I still read comics, um, not as much as I used to, but, um, and you know, I, I watch all the Star Wars shows and movies, and all that stuff. And, do a lot of fan art too me too wow. i'm a big nerd so i will watch anything like dark crystal uh yeah. anything like that uh so let me ask you a lot of like uh a lot of teachers or uh, uh grown-ups and adults they don't consider like comic books and things as reading where do you fall on that argument i think it is i think it really gets kids into reading uh my daughter um when she was starting to, we read a lot of picture books. Um, I did as well when I was a kid. My mom read to me, my brother all the time. That that was one of the things that got me into illustration, um, looking at the old like uh, Grimm's fairy tales type of stories, and as well as all of Ezra Jack Keats and all the classic illustrators. Um, but uh, my daughter, when we first started. When she started, first started reading, we would read a lot of graphic novels together, like all ages graphic novels. And she would read like the, 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 uh, the Babysitter Club books, uh, um, the uh, Raina Telemeyer, same name, right? Um, that she illustrates and um, a lot of her books. But, and that really, that uh, I, I noticed with a big change in my daughter's reading abilities um, and just be able to follow um, the, the storyline and uh, uh, emotion from the characters, it kind of uh, enhanced the, the story. But uh, I, and I, me personally, when I was a kid, uh, I used to read a lot of comic books when I was learning how to read. And uh, this brought me, brought more interest into uh, regular chapter books, that sort of thing. Yeah, I totally agree with that. I feel like anything that gets kids to pick up a book uh, is fantastic. If it's a comic book and that's what kids are interested in, pick it up, let them read it. So I love that. Uh, so the drawings in the Claude series are very, I don't know, they just really pop off the page. Uh, I'm wondering, did you uh, like work from life on that? Do you have a cat around the house that you studied? No, I, um, I've never owned a cat and uh, I have a dog. But uh, I've been around cats. Um, a lot of uh, internet research, I guess, with cats. Um, so I, I, I've, learned, <laughs> I've learned a lot of just the anatomy of cats. Um, I tend to be a little more cartoony with my work. So it was, I was trying to find a mix of uh, the realistic cat anatomy versus the, the weird, and he's an alien too, so he's, uh, it's going to have a little more expression than an average cat would. So, um, but uh, yeah, from, I guess from life, um, I, I keep a lot of uh, reference as far as my computer, as far as my iPhone, as far as, uh, uh, and I keep like binders like this for many bigger, pro bigger scale projects that I do that, you know, I, I have a lot of photos as far as like architecture and cats and animals and different people. Um, but yeah, I, uh, as far as, I just wanted to have a, have a really big, bold personality, lots of expression. Awesome. I definitely think you achieved that because, like, Claude is, a, like, a character in the book, but he's majorly a character in your illustrations. So you mentioned your, uh, like, kind of cartoonish style. Do you have an uh, another artist or illustrator that when you were younger, kind of was one of your chief inspirations? Yeah, that's another um, good question. There's, there's many. Um, uh, Jack Davis is probably one of my favorite artists. He did a lot of the work for Mad Magazine. Um, 
he just passed away a few years ago in his 90s. Uh, he, so he had a really long career stemming from like the, the early 50s to, or late 40s, early 50s to just a few years ago. Um, but his work um, had a huge impact and uh, still does today. And um, also uh, Mark Davis, who was a, a Disney illustrator, he designed a lot of the the rides at or the characters for the some of the, the, the films in like the rides at Disney World, Disneyland. Um, and I didn't it's sad to say I didn't really know his name until just a few years ago. I knew his work and uh, yeah, I just embarrassed to admit that. Um, also uh, like Chuck Jones that was one of the the, the Looney Tunes animators. Um, created Wiley e. Coyote and Roadrunner and some of those characters and did the you know the original animated Grinch film. He had a huge impact to his his expressive lines and um, weird expressions on his characters. And... Very cool. Uh, so I notice on your Instagram that you tend towards the the speculative when you're going uh, for what you like to draw. Uh, so things like uh, fantasy characters or a lot of Halloween stuff. Uh, is that like, what about uh, speculative or fantasy elements appeals to you as an artist? Um, good question. Um, I just, I just feel like there, the, there's so many different routes you can take with that. There's really no limits. Um, I just like world building as far as uh, uh, the question. Um, well, I've always been a big fan of Halloween and uh, just the weird macabre uh, images. And uh, sometimes I, I like to combine the two, Halloween, but that's what I'm kind of, Inktober just started yesterday. So I'm kind of doing that this year. Just I kind of have a slight Halloween theme with everything. And this year, I'm just having a lot of fun with it, just creating. It's going to be mostly fan weird fantasy and kind of a mixture of Halloween and fantasy. Um, also, I've been kind of planning, uh, for the past few years, I've been I kind of a pipe dream of eventually doing a, a web comic uh, or a graphic novel. Um, I'm not much of a writer, but I've been putting together a lot of fantasy-based characters for that. It would be set in a fantasy world, uh, uh, sorcerers and dragons and stuff like that. But I wanted to ha have a little bit of a different feel than a lot of like the uh, traditional fantasy films. Uh, that's kind of like what I always liked about the, the, the Henson stuff is because it kind of gave you a really unique um, like with the, like with like a movie like The Dark Crystal, he didn't really do the obvious. They did a lot of it was Brian Froud, uh, the designer on that film, but they did a lot of really bizarre stuff that you don't really see in traditional fantasy. And that's kind of one of the things I like to incorporate. Awesome. So uh, I noticed uh, in an interview that you talked about how you do your drawings first in pencil and then you do them in brush and then you do the color work on the computer, right? Mm -hmm. If you were, uh, like, if you had any advice for a young artist on how to get started, maybe someone who's interested in drawing but doesn't really know very much more about that, but knows that's what they want to do with their life, what would you tell them? Well, first thing is draw all the time. And that's kind of one of the things that, I mean, when I was growing up, I was always drawing, but I feel like I could have done more at the time. Like I. I was always just kind of doodling in notebooks and, and I had lots of unfinished drawings laying around. I get bored or bored with something I was working on and I just kind of left it off. Um, I would say draw as much as you can. Uh, don't worry about going back and redrawing something. I do that all the time. Uh, you know, that's how you learn by making mistakes or um, revisiting a project. Um, like with the latest Inktober, uh, piece I did yesterday, uh, I I drew it twice just to do the, just a di different version and see how they vary. Um, and as far as uh, for for young artists wanting to get started, I guess um, now with the dawn, well, 
period. And it's been around a while, but I, I, one thing that changed for me was putting my work online. And I only started doing that about 12 years, 12 or 13 years ago. And I joined on like programs like now Instagram, but at the time DeviantArt and uh, just sharing your work with other artists and being inspired by other artists. And your work gets noticed. I mean, if it's passed around or people are making comments or um, just that whole net networking with other artists has really helped me quite a bit. That's um, fantastic. Fantastic advice. Thank you. And if uh, people wanted to see what you were doing for Inktober or see what you're working on now, where could they follow you? You can follow me on Instagram. I'm, that's where I'm most active. And um, yeah, I guess Instagram is probably the best. I, I have to get back to, uh, I had a blog at one time, but I've kind of abandoned it. Um, but Instagram is probably the best place to find me. That's all my newest stuff always pops up on there. Um, yeah, I, probably the best spot. All right. Well, thanks so much. And thanks for the illustrations in this book. They're really great. And my kid is a reluctant reader and he saw me reading this for work and leaned over and was like, I want to read that. And I was like, oh, okay. So <laughs> thanks a Good. bunch. And it was really great talking with you. Great talking with you too. Thank you so much. Hi, it's Miss Crystal and we're doing Claude this week. And I'm going to show you a little bit about wood burning. Um, one of the you, you, you only need actually two things to do wood burning, which is a piece of wood and a wood burner. Um, if you want to add a little bit more things, I actually bought a kit and it came with a few extra things. It came with some slabs of wood. Um, it came with some tracing paper and it came with um, some samples of different things to make. It came with um, some watercolor paints some paint brushes, pencils, and several different um, tips and things. Um, I'm only going to use one tip today just to, sh just to show you guys what to do, but I have my wood burner plugged in. It's warmed up now, and I'm just going to get started. If you are going to do the tracing method, I would suggest um, drawing your picture first. I just found a little kitty cat that I like. It's very simple, and you're going to want to put it on your piece of wood. But first, before you put it your piece of wood, you're going to want to put your tracing paper down on your piece of wood. And then very, um, I would say not gently, but kind of forcibly, make sure it stays in the same spot. And then you're going to want to trace around um, all the bold lines that you see on um, your picture. So that when it's on your wood, it ends up like this. So, like again, you're going to take a pencil with your tracing paper on top of your wood, with your picture on top of your tracing paper, and you're going to trace all of these lines right here. Um, and if you wanna check on it, you can always gently lift it up on one side, hold it down, and then look on the other side. You just don't wanna move your paper because it's really hard to get it back in that same spot so that all your lines stay together. Now, once you've traced that, then you're ready to do kind of your wood burning. Um, to get an idea of what you want to do with this. It's really simple. Um, with the wood burner, it, it looks like a, it, it's a little wand like this. You do not want to put your hand anywhere near the metal part here. Um, it's very hot. It will burn. So this is definitely for um, older kids, not younger ones. And even right here, it's a little bit warm. So try to keep your hand. That, that Mine comes with this little rubber thing. It keeps it cool. And you can hold it like this. Um, I, I'm more comfortable holding with a pencil. I've seen people hold it like this and use it. Um, whatever is more comfortable. I mean, you can even hold it like this if you're more comfortable. It just depends on how you're comfortable with it. Again, mine's a pen. So once you get your trace done, you're gonna take your wood burner and your piece of wood, and I'm gonna show it up here to you. Just very slowly, you're going to take and go over your lines here. Now you're not gonna, I'm not sure if you guys are gonna see it or not, but um, it is burning into the wood. It's slowly turning, where the, where the trace paper is sort of blackish gray, it's turning brown from where I'm burning it um, with it. And actually, you know what I can do is I'm gonna 
since this is my back side, I'm going to make a big gold line here so that you guys can see how brown it kind of gets or how it, it's kind of burnt out there. Um, and this just is, I'm not worried about it because I, I did, I already did the completed so you can see the other side, but see how brown that kind of gets like that. And I, I know you guys probably have seen wood burn art, but it's, that's what it does. And it also creates a groove wherever you've burnt and it cools down pretty quick. So I'm not going to, you're not going to hurt yourself if you, if you touch it, I wouldn't say immediately, but, um, not too long after you've burned it, it cools down pretty quick, but it does create sort of like a groove where you've burnt into the wood and, um, creates a barrier with that. And all you want to do is you want to continue to follow each one of these lines until you've traced everything out on the outside. And, um, then once you do that, then you can go through and put in some fine details. Um, like I want freckles on my cat, so I'm going to put a couple of dots here. And I know it wasn't on the tracing paper, but I'm like, my cat needs freckles because he has whiskers coming out. And um, you know what? I'm going to color in his mouth, not his tongue, but his mouth, because I'm going to paint this afterward. So I'm going to color in his mouth right here and maybe color in his belly a little bit and make stripes inside of his stripes so that it looks like he's um, a striped kitty cat with that. This is, it, it looks complicated, but it's not really not, it's not really, um, it's not as difficult to do this as you would think. Um, I think the, the, the practice is, is touch, uh, holding this without burning yourself. So I'll just be careful with this, but um, even with this is a simple drawing, the more you do it, um, and with any type of art, um, you'll get better at it, and you'll eventually be able to do it freehand um, and create your own artwork without having to trace something or, or whatnot. Now, once you have this all completed and you think you have what um, you want to do with it, here's kind of, to me, the, the interest, interesting part. Now, I've already... Um, worked on this and, and got it pre-done for you, but this is the, what I, this is what we kind of started with. Oops, definitely don't want that to fall down on the floor. <laughs> um, this is what we kind of started with. And then what I did is once I done traced it, I took my watercolors and I just painted in the areas that I wanted to, to, to have some color. Um, with it and then put of course my meow up there but this is kind of the completed work um, you can add a border around here with the wood burner um, you can color this in if you want to or just leave it plain but these are just it's super easy it's a, it's inexpensive and it's a great activity for you to really work on um, a different type of artistic ability and of course it's a cat because Claude is a cat I wanted to make a friendly cat, but Claude, you could make you an alien cat as well. So I hope you guys maybe check out and try it. Um, I know sometimes the libraries, uh, we offer this, uh, we offer during our programs different activities. So when uh, the next time you see on our calendar events that we offer a maybe a wood burning or an art program, check it out, register for it and join us. So thank you for joining me with my wood burning and I will see you again soon. Mm. Ah. Oh, you earthlings are still here. Did you have fun doing your activities at the library? Well, I'm not surprised. Claude is a very entertaining kitty. And I hope you had fun learning all about me as the most ruthless warlord in the galaxy. Be sure to come back in two weeks when we do, oh, I don't have fingers, in two weeks when we do more activities based on the Sunshine Readers books. And now, get out of here. It's time for my nap. Mm.